So, uh, and, and a great example of that is, is our next moderator. Robert and I have known each other for uh, way too long. And um, even though we both look really young. Um, that was not funny. Um, <laughs> So uh, he, uh, he is uh, uh, one of the, the, the chairs of this, uh, this event. Um, he is also a tremendous mentor out there in the industry. He is a really, really brilliant researcher and ethnographer. Um, his specialty is in kind of generational research. Um, he really does specialize in, in your generation, the millennial generation, um, or Generation Y, or whatever you want to call yourself this week. And, um, he has really educated me on, on um, the shifting tides of the generations and, and media usage. Um, he runs an unbelievably great uh, company called Minor & Co Studios, um, which specializes in very much um, primarily qualitative research. Um, and he is one of the big thinkers in this industry. So if you can you know, grab a couple of minutes um, with him before the end of the day, you are doing yourself a huge favor. And he is a great representation of how even something as seemingly dry as research um, can be a creative enterprise. Um, and we were just talking a couple seconds ago with, on, on the stage here with a young gentleman th about how, you know, even if you're not a writer or a director or a programming executive, it doesn't mean you can't be creative. It doesn't mean that there's not a job in this industry for you. So this panel, um, which is about research, launching new ideas, and seriously cool careers in the research field, is a great example of that. Without further ado, Mr. Robert Miner. Thank you, sir. Thanks, everybody. Um, I have the honor of having with me on the panel here today. I've got Sean Merriweather who's uh, with Evan at Pivot, uh, Allison Hillhouse from MTV, and Jake Katz from Revolt. Um, now, who here, when they were a kid, said, when I grow up, I want to be in marketing research. <laughs> How many said I want to be in television or media? Okay. So for every minute that you see in TV, there are about 1,000 people behind the scenes. Some of them are in marketing research. So uh, let me toss this to the panel. Simple question. When you were growing up, what did you think you wanted to be? And then how the heck did you get to where you are today? Let's start with Jake. <laughs> Okay, when I, when I was growing up, I thought I was gonna run a skateboard clothing company. <laughs> You're not supposed to laugh at that, it still might happen. Um, and and I, I learned very early on, you know, that you can say you know what you wanna do, and then there's opportunities that come to you, and you find a fine line between riding the two of them. And I was living in New York, I was working in a bakery, and a guy named Jesus, I, that was his name, walked in. and. <laughs> Put, put his business card down on the table and said, can you have the owner call me? And they were friends. And his business card said, MTV Trace. And I knew that one of the milestones I had to hit coming out of college was to get an internship. I had a friend that graduated who was like, I can't get a job because I have no internship experience. So all I was focused on was just getting an internship, just something on my resume other than a bakery. And at that point, I was really focused on going into marketing because marketing gets a lot of press. It sounds cool. We all think it's like some guy... Well, you know, in the field at some festival with the backwards hat, just like doing rad stuff. And when I was, so that guy, Jesus, got me an information on MTV, <laughs> and thank the Lord. And, and so, and then the HR girl was like, have you ever heard of marketing research? And I thought marketing research for MTV sounded really cool, because that's what I thought marketing a little bit was, was just thinking about the people, about the audience. Um, when I... When I grew up, I wanted to be a writer, and uh, at some point I realized um, I was a pretty um, average writer, <laughs> and you have to be really good to be a professional writer. Um, and uh, I graduated in 99, so it was a, a while ago, but um, I, I actually really enjoyed market research in college, and um, I ended up in advertising and account management, because there's actually a lot of entry-level positions there. It's kind of an easy transition. After like three months, I knew I hated it, and I stayed in it for like nine years. And um, throughout those nine years, though, I really pushed doing research experiences the whole time. Anytime there was a project where I could work with the client. I worked on brands like Visine and Benadryl, not exciting, but anytime there's a project to research people and their allergies, like I got in on it. And eventually after about eight or nine years, I was able to create a resume that was really 
research focused, even though that, that wasn't you know, technically what I was um, doing in account management. Then um, I moved over to a um, strategy research job in an agency. And my dream in life, I think for 15 years, was to do teen research. And one day I was at this agency and I literally Googled millennial consumer insights and like pop the first thing was, there's a job at MTV. And I know that that's not usually how easy it is to find a job, but then I just sent my resume in and uh, then I've been at MTV for four years researching teens and 20-somethings like yourself. Um, when I was growing up, I actually had no idea what I wanted to be. And that's I, okay. <laughs> um, I sort of waffled every year. Um, one thing I saw a lot of people around me in my family working really hard, having to go to work when they were sick. So one thing I was really adamant about was being able to have vacation time and benefits. And it was really that basic for me. Um, while I was in college, I interned for a financial services company in which I learned financial services was not for me. Um, so I graduated and tried to figure out where I wanted to go, and I thought entertainment and media, you know, it sounded like a great idea. I watch TV, you know, I listen to the radio, and I literally started sending my resume into job banks. I actually don't recommend this today. This was, a, <laughs> this was kind of to Allison's point. This was several years ago, and um, that's how I ended up at ABC Family, which at the time and still is sort of a millennial-focused network. Perfect. Now, you couldn't be in more radically different organizations. I mean, you're, you know, you're, you're definitely in startup mode. You know, you've got a great big parent, but you guys are sort of a maverick network. Both of your organizations are probably in total smaller than we can, when we combine Colleen, Tanya, and da David's shops for research alone over at Viacom. So tell me about how many people are in your research department and what are the different roles and responsibilities that are there? Let's start on the easier one here. Sure. So um, in, our, <clears throat> in our company, there's three people who technically fall in research. One is responsible for the product, meaning the TV shows. One is responsible for showing advertisers the composition of the audience, meaning here's who Revolt reaches, here's why you should do business with us, and if you did business with us, here's what it looked like. And then there's me. And my role is a little bit unique, and I think Allison and I have kind of similar roles, which is basically, and they're kind of rare. Uh, it, it's, it's like a new thing in the industry to basically, for companies to invest in, um, I guess what you can call marketplace intelligence, independent of the product. So my job is to study culture independent of Revolt and then be kind of <clears throat> an advisor to Revolt, but also an advisor to our, the brands who work with Revolt. So I go and talk to Pepsi. Here's what we see happening in culture. Here's what it might mean for your business and serve as kind of a consultant to them and anybody else who comes on Revolt's roster, as well as the media industry as a whole. So. There's so much disruption out there. I think all the cable providers are very freaked out right now that you guys are going to ruin their business. <clears throat> and they're not totally wrong. <laughs> and so I think that everybody is looking at a new company like us. So the difference is when I was at MTV, you know, that's a brand that has had incredible success with this demographic for multiple generations. Revolt is a blank sheet of paper, and it's building from the ground up. And so I think that's a very different strategic problem, which is how do we pivot a brand that has heritage versus how do we build something that's relevant for today. And so for us, we get a lot of attention from you know, the big wigs like Procter & Gamble, from Time Warner, because they're looking at us like you're the test and learn. You know, you're not pivoting, so you're building from the ground up. And so I kind of am the liaison between what Revolt is and, and how they think about their own audiences. And let's hear from the Viacom mothership. So at MTV alone, there's at least 40 people in the research department. And then there's VH1 and CMT and all the other channels you referenced. Um, there's so many different functions. And I think in college, you don't know about all these opportunities there are in market research. And I actually hear from HR people sometimes they have trouble recruiting people because they're like, people just don't know about research. And they don't know that um, they're not pursuing it. Um, there's people who do ratings. They you know, figure out how many people are watching our shows and, and deal with Nielsen. There's people who research our marketing campaigns and understand how effective was that teen mom campaign at reaching you guys. There's people who do um, digital research who say, you know, 20,000 people looked at this article on MTV.com and how does that relate to other kinds of um, you know, things that we're posting and really dive deep into the analytics of our digital properties. Um, and then uh, there's people who test shows, pilot research, which is really interesting if you like stories, if you like narratives. And those are the people who, you know, we just um, greenlit a whole bunch of new shows. They go and test them with people like you and see what you think. They go in a focus group room and they find out whether you love it or hate it and then decide whether we should actually produce it as a show. 
Um, now what I do, like Jake said, is kind of rare, but it's getting bigger in the industry, is kind of this generational trends slash cultural research um, team. And what we do is purely understand what's going on with you guys in your daily life like what you're Snapchatting, um, what high school clicks look like, what the hookup scene is like today, what um, bus businesses young people are starting. So I'm just like really the eyes and ears and trying to understand what you guys are doing all day. And then I go share that with the producers and then they think about it and they're like, huh, maybe I should make a show about that. That's kind of an interesting idea. So it's really keeping pulse with you guys. Um, we, I'm gonna just do a small tiny pitch and I'll turn it over. Go for um, it. We do panels all the time where we're talking to people like you nonstop. And if you want to sign up for one of our panels, um, we pay for them. You can give your email to Jen over there in the corner at the end, because we are always looking for people to be fresh voices talking to MTV. That's my pitch. You got it. All right, Sean. Great. So at Pivot, there's technically three people dedicated to research. And we sort of do a little bit of everything right now. I would say sort of the big division is in terms of the clients we support. So we have a team, or a person rather, that's focusing on supporting the programming and scheduling team, trying to figure out what shows do we pick up, where do we put them on the schedule, you know, is this a weekend show, is this a show people watch at dinner time, and things like that. Um, whereas I'm focused a little more on serving the advertising sales team and the affiliate sales team. So ad sales is trying to help understand who our audience is and also figuring out how to present that to advertisers so they'll want to spend their money on advertising to reach consumers like you guys. Additionally, the affiliate sales and content distribution team, they're the ones going to the TV, bro TV providers, the Time Warners, the U-verses of the world, and saying, this is why you need to carry Pivot. You know, we're doing something different. And one of the things that we have, you know, we talk a lot about the double bottom line, and I'm sure Evan's mentioned that today, and our mission, and trying to use that as sort of a hook to get people engaged with the network. And then as a part of that, I also do some digital research as a part of the ad sales team. And really, I would say with in pivot research, it really sort of depends on what's important to the business at that time. Um, sometimes it's focus groups trying to figure out what shows we should do, helping the development team making you know a season two better from the prior season and taking those learnings. Like Allison mentioned, we also do have an online community panel in which we engage with people to find out what they like, what they don't like, how they're spending their time. Some of the stuff we ask them is, if you were a car, what sort of car would you be? But then we also ask them things, you know, to watch clips that we've done and say, did you know about this issue going on in Peru? You know, how do you feel about this? Are you going to tell your friends and families about this? Are you more likely to take action and do things like that? Great. Thank you. Now, um, uh we a lot of people's vision of market research is sort of shaped by that mad men, you know, people who don't really have any empathy or emotion, always wearing brown shoes, occasionally breathe through their mouth, are really disconnected from everybody else. But clearly, research is now sexy. So, uh, in taking in taking a look at this, uh, what what brings the sexy f to research for you? What is it that really turns you on when you're in a research project? <clears throat> I just love numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think. Um, we, when, I, when I was at MTV, we were blessed to have a boss named Nick Shore, and he came in from the agency world and just ripped apart every expectation of what research means. And I remember on his first day, he tweeted, people are more interesting than numbers. And I thought that that was, <clears throat> this is the new SVP of research, you know, kind of a bit scary, you know, to put something like that out in the marketplace. And I think we've seen in the past few years just, you know, we talk a lot in business about the concept of the Trojan horse. So, like, how do you get a seat at the table that's not the obvious seat at the table? And once you have a seat at the table, what are you doing once you get there that's your real motivation? And I think the media disruption is a very interesting, media industry is a very interesting place right now because there's so many questions that are unanswered. And research has a humongous seat at the table. And, you know, numbers aren't quite doing it anymore. People are thirsty and hungry for ideas. And... I think now more than ever, the researchers and brands like MTV and Pivot and Revolt get to play a role which is more like a strategic advisor, and I think that's pretty sexy. Right. Um, I'm very, very curious about human behavior and about people, and my favorite thing is when I get in a room with a bunch of teen girls and I'm asking them about their lives, and they are telling me like really intimate, personal things about Snapchat fights they've had, or like betrayal, um, and really rich insights. And 
sometimes I feel like I'm playing therapist a little because sometimes they even ask my advice. <laughs> I don't know what good that is because I didn't even have social media when I was in high school. Um, but it, being able to translate that to producers and be like, here is really like the raw voice of the consumer gets me so excited. Um, I, just, I just love hearing from young people. Um, yeah, I would say two things that really excite me. One is finding insights and sort of telling stories and connecting them together. And another thing that, especially being at Pivot, which is a smaller network, I love trying to find new ways to measure our audience and qualify our audience. That's a little different than what other people are doing. One of the things that we did a project about a year ago now for Monster.com used some biometrics. So we had people in the lab and literally did eye tracking and track their heartbeat to see, you know, if they were excited by the content and stuff like that. That's very exciting to me. That's great. And you, you tackled a couple of things here, and, and Jake, you hit that as well. And we heard in an earlier panel a bit, and this is a little bit inside baseball, but the monetization uh, methodology behind TV is based on the old TV model. And it doesn't really measure what's happening on all the other devices that you guys are using to watch TV instead. As a matter of fact, until a few years ago, we were still fighting the good fight as researchers of convincing the powers that be that people are going to watch something you know, other than just the set-top cable box uh, there to get their TV. So in looking at that, and as you're starting to look at you know, the myth of audience measurement, you know, as people are looking at it today, we know a lot of research is measuring the emperor's naked in seam. You know, so that's a lot of times you get that assignment. It's like, okay, you know, but how do you guys look, what do you think is happening in audience measurement and how do you see that changing with your jobs today? Um, so traditionally TV is treated as a reach vehicle and I, I feel like that's a term that someone uses on a panel and you're like, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> basically means people buy it for the size of its audience and that's true across all media. I think what's basically happening is TV content continues to drive the pop culture conversation. TV as the medium is kind of more and more outdated each day. Like how many people here have sat down and watched traditional TV in the past week? And then quite a few. Okay, we're good. Good. And then, got a job still, thank God. And then how many people have watched a TV show online, whether it's through Netflix or Apple TV or, oh my God, even the camera guy. <laughs> Um, and so basically what that means is, you know, uh, so Pivot and Revolt are quite new. And so we've both been out in the marketplace and getting feedback from people who are like, really, another TV channel and more content in a world that already has way too many TV channels and way too much content? And I think we felt like something I've learned in the past year is that TV is no longer a reach vehicle. It's an engagement vehicle. And digital is a reach vehicle. So in advertising, you look at reach frequency and engagement, and it used to be you get reach and frequency on TV, and now TV is where you give the people something to talk about, and as they talk about it through social, that's where you check the box of reach and frequency. So that is, you know, to answer your question about audience measurement, I think, do our networks have massive audiences? Of course not. We're brand new. Will they someday? Sure, and we're getting there. MTV has a humongous audience. You know, but how you use TV in a world where media is everywhere, I think overall is changing. Yeah, especially now that niche is the norm. Um, I don't work in measurement at MTV, but there are, you know, like we said, at Viacom, there's probably like 50 people who are devoted to figuring out how we're going to measure, uh, you know, viewership because, yeah, you're not just tuning in, like, let me watch that show at 8 p.m. because it's the only opportunity I have to watch that show. Um, I, I don't think anyone's figured it out right yet. And um, I think it, we're really at the stage where it's, everyone's about to combust, though, because, you know, we're seeing traditional TV viewership decline because people just aren't you know, tuning in anymore, but you're still watching our shows, and we know that because we see how many times you're downloading Teen Wolf or you're watching it um, on your iPad. So it's all about, we just are at the stage where we have to convince the industry of n new ways of measuring it, and they're just stuck in that kind of old thing where they only care about the ratings on the television set. So we're at just growing pains in figuring that out right now. Yeah, no, I would totally agree with what both Jake and Allison said. I think we're sort of on the cusp of a big change with an audience measurement. I can say for sure at Pivot, audience measurement is still really important. It's sort of the backbone of what we do. And, you know, it's a way to measure the audience. But at the same time, it's trying to qualify that audience and determine engagement and say, you know, our audience is doing this and this is why they're unlike people that are watching NBC or CBS. And that's also become really important for us as well. Now, now more so than a lot of industries, TV in and of itself, because it's supporting a creative enterprise, is in many ways a water cooler Kool-Aid culture where everybody has to sort of bond together and fly the flag. 
Researchers, however, have to be the outsider on the inside. They have to be the essential irritant. And sometimes they actually have to disagree with the CEO. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about that role of research. Why don't we start on the other end, Sean? And talk a little bit about that outsider on the inside and being that essential irritant. Because without that, that little grit of sand, oysters wouldn't be pushing out pearls. And our job is sort of to still irritate the flabby belly of TV and make sure they're getting things right. Sure, yeah, I feel like sometimes research is the one in the room that's like, we're not comfortable with that. We don't think that's what's gonna happen. And everyone's like, grrr. Um, which is sometimes difficult, but I think often it makes the entire organization better. Usually we come up with a different solution or a better solution to come about with what we're doing, whether it's a show, whether it's measurement or you know, trying to qualify our audience, picking up a show, things of that nature. Um, you know, a lot of things go back in terms of like long range planning and estimating our audience, which is to Jake's point, we're a year old network, so it's really hard to determine where we're gonna be six years from now, 10 years from now, but we have to do our best guess on based on things that are going on in the marketplace. And that's you know a time where research definitely has to serve be very vocal and sort of stick to their guns because a lot of that can sort of throw the entire business off. So about maybe six years, seven years ago at MTV, um, we were still programming to Generation X. And if you don't know who Generation X is, it's people who are roughly between the ages of like 35 and 50 right now. And um, the network really hadn't caught up with the times that there was a whole new generation of young people coming in. And um, they had some very specific ideas about how they were creating shows. And the research department had to come in and say, like, this isn't making any sense. You're showing kids who hate their parents in shows. This generation of millennials loves their parents, their best friends. They text them 15 times a day. I don't know if that's true for any of you, but I see some head nods at least. Um, and we had to say, we need to really rethink about how we're talking to this audience and we did and, Matt, and Jake was a big part of this because he was at MTV at this time and I was just coming coming in um, we did this massive just revamp of, of learning about who Millennials are and telling um, all the producers you've got to start thinking differently and it and it changed the network and we produced a ton of hit shows over the past you know six years from Teen Mom to Teen Wolf to um, awkward to faking it whatever it is all based kind of on this new understanding of who the generation is um, I, I think, so I totally agree with what these guys said. It only seemed like a few years ago that research typically was the feedback resource. You know, how did the show do? What did the audience think of that? And then there kind of became this growing opportunity to make it the source of inspiration. And I think that, to me, is something that is, is significantly more welcomed into creative discussions. You know, you can't tell somebody their baby's ugly. Yeah. And I think that that's, a, that's always the, the challenge in research. And I think... So you no, no, no baby makeover shows? <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, really just as a researcher thinking of how can I... And, you know, if you even looked at, like, Google words, you'd probably see the word research has been flat, and the word insights has spiked in the past few years. You know, it's all about insights now. It's less about research. And so I think focusing on fusing interesting insights into you know, significant uh, forums throughout your company and being really a resource that's there to inspire people and not tell people their baby's ugly, tell people their product sucks, tell people their show didn't do well, because that's, that's not very helpful, right? We're all in it together. Um, and I think, you know, it also comes down to communication skills and relationships. I mean, the irony of the skill set of the researcher is you're kind of an introvert, you know, if you're really comfortable kind of analyzing numbers behind a computer screen. But what actually makes a researcher great at their job is having great relationships with people so they can pick up the phone and call that creative stakeholder and say, hey, heads up before this goes out, maybe we should put an online video on YouTube first. And, you know, I mean, just have those discussions candidly. And you've, again, we've used this term, which is a little bit of an insider term here, insight. Um, and that's, that's one of the hot, you know, that's one of the sexy words in research right now. Um, in looking at research, often people fall back on observation. And sometimes observation is what we call discovery. People sit on their sofa, pick up a remote, and turn on their TV. That's not an insight, okay? So insight comes when you combine, you know, experience, observation, intuition, and opinion. And I think that's one of the things that's changing as well is honoring the fact that research has a role at the table because they also have an opinion shaped by their intuition and their observations and experience. So tell me a little bit about sort of that formula, you know, as you're doing that balance and checks and balances for yourself on where you let your opinion sort of come into play as well. 
I, so I think I, I would personally just go back to relationships for a second, because if you have the right relationships in a company that's anywhere north of 150 people, you're just naturally hooked into what's going on. You know that they're going to lock on the agency they choose to produce the conference, they're going to green light the shows in November, they're going to redo the website in February. And so you have to take it upon yourself to reach out and be part of those discussions as they happen. Um, and I think the more that you kind of know what's going on, the bigger impact you can have. And the bigger impact you can have um, before the fact versus saying, oh, OK, the website launched. Maybe I should do some focus groups and test it. And then really, what kind of impact are you going to have versus, hey, I'm going to bring three PowerPoint slides to this meeting. I proactively did them. Let me just give you guys a lay of the land real quick. And then, boom, that's value add right there. Um, yeah, I, did you have two questions? What is, how do we use insights or? Or, or where, what is your role sort of of your opinion in shaping how you see insights? Oh, okay, opinion. Well, I think, I guess two parts here is one, we're constantly pushing ourselves on insight. I've already brought up this example of Snapchat, but like, yes, we could go tell producers, guess what? Teens are using Snapchat. That is what we call an observation. But when you come to them and say they get in Snapchat fights because somebody is taking one Snapchat and sending it, you know, screen grabbing it, sending it to another friend and causing this kind of like chain of um, betrayal and this is like really one of the major stress points of teens and here's how they feel about it, that is an insight. That is like some really interesting nugget that they can use for their programming. And in terms of getting them to kind of, take our opinions, um, you know, it is about just being inspirational and helpful and establishing good relationships. And then you get to a point where you can say, hey, you know, these are five really, really stressful things that are happening with teenagers right now, and these would make interesting storylines. And it is a fine line, because they're creatives, and they don't want you to tell them what to do, but if you get a good enough relationship, they'll, they'll listen. Um, so what I would say is I often feel like what I do is a blend of art and science. So the science is the measurement and looking at the metrics and analyzing that. And then the art is sort of what you do with that and who you take it to. Finding Sometimes it's just finding one little piece of information in a focus group or seeing a trend that's happening online and then saying, you know, we think that this is what's going on. So as Robert was saying, talking a lot about intuition. And some of that is you just develop it over time from working at different places, seeing different trends, even talking to people in the industry saying, are you noticing these things or not? Um, and all of that ends up being really valuable in the end. Uh, now, now, Evan mentioned that it was almost a decade ago that he and I were first sitting down and talking about taking a look at millennials, you know, and recognizing millennials weren't the kids of today, they were the adults of, the, of today, the idea of the millennial adult. Um, and all of us here up here are deep into the land of millennials. Uh, some of us are coattail millennials and Xers. Some of us are forever millennials in mindset. And some of us are actual millennials. Uh, when you think about millennials today and what people should know, what are some of the myths that you would bust or some of the things that you would reinforce that you think are sort of the hallmarks of today? Um, I always say that this is a generation that has a tremendous sense of power, but also kind of struggles with how to use that power. Um, you can start a movement online, you can go launch a business, you can skip college and go launch a business, um, you can create anything um, because of technology and um, get other people on board. And they also have parents um, kind of supporting you throughout this process and saying you can do it and um, giving you a lot, a, a big voice all of your life. Then at the same time, there's a lot of forces working against you. The economy is bad. There's a lot of competition, you know, in the, this country as well as globally, um, and a lot of pressure to succeed and live up to everybody's expectations. So I think that kind of like understanding that dynamic of this real sense of power and like I can do it and I can go make over a company at the same time, like fear because um, you have a lot of pressures on you and forces working against you. Yeah, I agree with that. Another thing I would add on to what Allison said is we talk a lot about a pivot, sort of this plan B where a lot of millennials were told growing up, you know, if you do this and you go to high school and you graduate from college, you'll get a good job and then you'll be living on your own and all of that. And then the economy sort of went bad and <laughs> that didn't really pan out. So a lot of millennials are trying to figure out what's next for them. That being said, they're really hopeful and altruistic about their future. Um, and, you know, of course, relying on their parents. But I think they definitely are really involved in trying to make the world a better place, which is a part of, you know, our mission at Pivot, too. Um, so, yeah, that's what I would say. I, I mean, I think that um, it's tricky because the word millennials seems to be everywhere right now. And um, we, you know, so anybody here not know what Revolt is? I see a show of hands. 
Okay, good, you guys all know. So Sean comes, Sean Diddy comes, owns Revolt. Um, and early on, you know, we, we were doing some work together. We were doing a focus group together, if you can picture that. And <laughs> I was prepping him beforehand, and to his credit, he whip, whipped off his sunglasses, and we were indoors, he had sunglasses on. And he looked at me and he said, turn off the camera. And, he, and so Shooter turned off the camera and he said, do you believe all that shit you see out there about millennials? <laughs> and I thought in that moment, it, it's absolutely true. This word has become abs incredibly overblown. But I think what is st still extremely powerful, um, and at the end of the day, is the one gigantic myth is that millennials sums up 100 to 80 million people. But the word millennial is a cultural context that every brand around the world is thinking about right now to plan their future. So it's a really powerful conversation with a few landmines, right? If you walk in, you start talking to somebody and you know, these agencies are getting younger, these brands are getting, Burger King's CEO is 32 years old. You know, so you walk into a forum like that, start talking about millennials, see how that goes. <laughs> and so I think that um, you know, to understand that the reason, and I, I do absolutely give MTV the credit of seeding this word into the masses, um, originally, I think it was kind of used to sensitize the internal creatives to, yes, you're still an expert at the essence of youth culture. It has a different flavor today based on the fact there's a cultural context of our demographic now that there wasn't 10, 15, 20 years ago. So to me, that continues to be why we think about millennials and millennial and we approach strategic questions this way. But I think there's also many different ways to look at culture. And it's also an interesting experiment to ask yourself, take something like the craft single. You know, if you threw a bunch of millennial insights at that, you would leave it feeling like it had to hire some artisan cheese maker, it has to have a Kickstarter campaign, and at the end of the day, the craft single is going to be here in 10 years. So there's kind of two sides to this coin, you know? And, and that is sort of the changing landscape of it. I mean, you know, originally, <clears throat> when people looked at millennials and even coattail Xers and they saw hipster culture, you know, hipster originally meant ironic, aloof, distant, sort of a faux person. And then hipster became about passions. It became passions for craft beer, for food, for artisanal attributes, for bicycling, for knitting. So these changes take place within. So, so any of these millennial constructs are not fixed. They're constantly evolving. So I think one of the things that our job as researchers is to always inform you know, the people who we're, we're stewarding, the people who we're working with, on the changes that are taking place versus having them feel that these are fixed vocabulary items. Now, in terms of fixed vocabulary, um, there is no right answer to this next question. The generation after millennials, either whether they're younger than 14 or younger than 18, what do we call them and why? Uh, well, I've heard them called Gen Z, and I've also heard them called plurals. And I, I think the plurals kind of fits them well because there's, you know, in terms of diversity, there's no real group that has plurality per se. And I feel like they sort of encapsulate everything that the millennials already have, but it's like to the nth power. So they're more diverse. They're going to be more educated. They're going to be more open, more fostering to communities and, you know, creating those communities, caring about what's going on in the world around them and how that impacts the greater good. Yeah, I, I like the plurals um, definition uh, and title the, the most that's out there so far, though. It's hard to say. I mean, some generational experts say once they really come of age, once they're around 20 and you see like how they really shape up, then you can give them a name. I don't know. Um, I'd go with plurals right now. Um, I, I think it's tough to answer that question for me because I would encourage everybody to think about is a generational framework the next big idea in research? Mm -hmm. I mean, that was extremely important right now because we're living in a new world and there's a demographic that's very influential who is native to that new world. So we think about marketing through the lens of generations. Um, I got to give credit to my friend Scott Hess uh, who works at Spark and he basically wrote an article recently and you guys should all read it. And he was like, I don't really care what anybody calls them, but what the name is going to be should reflect that they are the post-millennial generation. So if the millennial generation was the first generation with one foot in the new world, one foot in the old world, what comes next will be post to all those attributes we studied about the millennial generation. What's the um, It's called the generation that follows what shall we call them or something like that. It was in last month's issue of Ad Week, I believe. Scott, if you Google Scott Hess, You'll find it. And that, that's to the point of, as researchers, making sure that you know, people are open to the fact that this is a moving target. It's changing. You know, it's not something which is fixed or a pigeonhole that everybody fits into. Now, it's a very tough job market out there for those of you who are looking for work. It's a very tough job market for those of us who are hiring as well. I think any of us will openly say that we probably interview 100 people for any one person you know, who can land in a position. So, so this is sort of an opportunity for, for the folks here to hear. When you're looking for sort of a candidate, for somebody who's going to be a fit for your team, 
What are the things that you look for? I'm looking for someone who really wants to do the job. Even if this is not your dream job, fake it in the cover letter. I see so many people are like, I'm not sure what I want to do, and I'm just like interviewing for this. I'm like, don't tell me that, even if that's true. Um, second off, put something extra in the, the resume, the portfolio, whatever you send it. I don't think people use that word portfolio anymore, but um, like, if you did a project in school that you think is interesting, share that. Or if you're like, hey, I did this like one page write up on some hot millennial trends and insights that I saw right now, that's gonna make you stand out because there's a lot of resumes that look exactly the same out there. So I always encourage people to put something creative into their resume. Yeah, I think making something that's creative that differentiates yourself is a huge help. Another thing I always look for in a candidate is someone that's curious and just loves to learn because I feel like being curious is probably something all three of us have in common and it's something that sort of pushes us to find those insights and develop strategy. I, I'd go first and foremost on communication skills. And I think it starts with that first email to that first discussion to that follow-up communication. You know, what does it feel like? And Because to me, it, it's like how, I mean, how socially aware are you, you know, that you can kind of manage yourself through this process? You know, sometimes you get these blind introduction letters that are like 14 paragraphs long, and I, I don't know what to do with that. You know, I feel, so, I feel terrible, but I, I, somebody else will know what to do with that. Um, and I've also had incredible interviews and never heard from the person again. And then, you know, three, four, five weeks later, get some note about, hey, just checking in. Well, guess what? You know, that door's closed. Obviously, I was interviewing many people that week and had to make a decision. Um, and I also think communication, strong communication skills are the most important thing in the world right now. I mean, most of your job will take place over email. And that sounds really depressing. It's not. It'll be cool. You'll get an iPhone. They'll pay for it. But the thing is, you know, that's, uh, think about that for a second, and that's, that's part of communication skills. And so I think that to me is the biggest thing, because in our world, you know, from there we can work on good ideas together and how to share and fuse in good ideas throughout companies, internally and externally. Yeah, like Jake said, it, when you're writing a thank you email after your interviews, A, say how much you want the job, but B, say like, it was really interesting we were talking about this, and I've been thinking more about this, and it caused me to do this. Also, do your research before the job. Stalk the person you're meeting with online. Say, I read that article you wrote. Like, those are things you should do. Perfect. And I think that's a great closing. We're getting the stop sign now. Thanks. You've been a marvelous panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.